first a few and a couple of announcements. Uh, we want to thank the uh, theater owners for very graciously making the venue available to us for the 2017 Mothman Festival. Yeah, thank you. And uh, also, uh, the uh, 3 o'clock um, Jason Hawes and J.D. Johnson uh, appearance will not take place. Uh, they're not here due to uh, personal issues. Uh, in its place, we will have a uh, round table hosted by Rosemary Ellen Guiley. So, uh, a couple things there. And at this point, I'd like to introduce George Dudding. George is a uh, local West Virginia author. He was born and raised in Mason County, West Virginia. Uh, he holds a bachelor's and master's degree from West Virginia University in uh, physics and mathematics. Uh, George is the author of several books on UFOs, aliens, Bigfoot, and other paranormal events. Uh, George will be speaking on the Silver Bridge disaster of 1967. So uh, please welcome George Dudding. I, uh, I'm here today to talk about the Silver Bridge. Um, I grew up here in Mason County, as he said, and uh, in 1967, I was actually uh, 16 years old, about ready to turn 17. I was a junior at Point Pleasant High School uh, when the Silver Bridge collapsed. Uh, I know a little bit about it because I was around here, and I was down here, uh, right through that wall, uh, there's a flood wall out there and I was on the other side of the flood wall about 45 minutes after it collapsed and I was watching the beginnings of the rescue operations and I stayed there until about midnight. Um, I'm going to begin by talking um, about the Silver Bridge. Uh, there's three dates right up here. 1927, that was when the construction began. 1928 uh, is when they had it finished and they dedicated it on Memorial Day. Then it fell in 1967. Its age was 39 years. Its replacement down here, the Silver Memorial Bridge, uh, just past the mouth of the Big Canal River, is now 48 years old. So as you can see, it's nine years older than the bridge it replaced. So it's been a while, and uh, I'll get uh, going here. Uh, First, okay, use this. Uh, first, the bridge contractor was the Gallia County Ohio River Bridge Company. The president of that was Dr. Charles E. Holzer. He was the founder of Holzer Hospital over in Galpolis, also the forerunner of the Holzer Clinic over here at Galpolis. The bridge was designed by the J.E. Griner Company out of Baltimore, Maryland. It was erected by the American Bridge Company, a U.S. steel company of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The estimated cost was $800,000. There was a cost reduction incentive, and that was if the contractor could figure out a way to reduce the cost, he had financial gain to be had. And so the cost reduction resulted in choosing an I-bar chain rather than a cable suspension. And that was a faulty error. Uh, when the bridge was finished, it was taken over and owned by the Gallia County, Ohio River Bridge Company and operated as a toll bridge. It was later owned by the West Virginia, Ohio Bridge Company and still operated as a toll bridge and was purchased by the state of West Virginia on December 26, 1941 for $1,040,000. The toll was removed on December 31, 1951. I was a year old at that time. The toll booths were, were removed two years later. Uh, when I was small, we used to go across and watch uh, movies at a driving theater at Canalga. And I actually can recall the toll gates being there. And that's been a long time ago. Uh, the first car to cross that bridge in 1928 was driven by Thomas P. Vogel and George Cumston. They were... Uh, uh, executives and uh, a foreman that were the ones that built this bridge. 
they decided to take the opportunity to be the first to drive clear across in a car. However, the bridge was dedicated on May 30th, 1928. This is a picture of what it looked like on the Ohio side, and you can see what kind of cars are sitting there. That's more what it was designed for. Uh, down here, Robert Heslop and James D. Robinson were the first to cross on that day. So we have two different kinds of people that were the first to cross. Right there's the bridge, and right here is the New York Central Railroad Bridge. Now I'm double spacing here. Uh, here's a good picture of the Silver Bridge. You may have seen this somewhere before. And I'd like to point out that right there is the toll gate. This is a concrete bridge abutment, and there's one on the other side. Right here is a box girder assembly. This end is resting on the bridge abutment. This end is resting on a big pier right here. And then there's two smaller piers here that support it in the center. That was firmly anchored in the earth. That part never failed. On the other side of the river, over there in Point Pleasant, you have the same setup. Out here, in the out here in the edge, right, and this is in the edge of the river, right here. You have a pier with a 131 foot tower on it, and right here you have a pier with a 130 foot tower on it. Now, here's the interesting thing about it is is this pier that holds the box girder assembly is way back here on the shore on dry land. And this, this big pier that holds this tower is right on the edge, right near the edge of the water. But however, the matching tower that corresponds to this one on the other side right there is way out in the river. As a matter of fact, this tower, this uh, pier right here that's on dry land is setting in the water right there. So what this means is, and I want to tell you, the collapse began here and went right over to there. This much, this much of the suspended bridge right in here was above dry land. Everywhere else, you were above water. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Uh, this is just a picture of a Ford Model T that I threw in there and it said it, was worth, it weighed 1,500 pounds. And I also found some indications that it might have weighed 1,200 pounds. Uh, compare that with, at that time, uh, a car weighed 3,500 pounds, but something like a Lincoln weighed 5,000 pounds. We multiplied the weight of our cars by three. Uh, here's a picture from 1940s, 1950s. Uh, you can see some older cars going there. And look right there. There's your toll gate right there. Now, a little bit about the length of the bridge. Down here, I have a total of 2,235 feet. That's reported total length. Now, right here and right here, we have a 241-foot approach and abutment on the West Virginia side. That is concrete anchored firmly in the soil of the earth. This right here is repeated. It's a duplicate of that on the Ohio side. So there's another 241 feet of the bridge anchored in solid earth, could not fall. Here's a 146.5 box girder span on the West Virginia side. That was also firmly anchored on solid piers. It did not fall. Same way on the Ohio side, a 146.5 uh, uh, foot box girder span was there also. Those did not fall. But right here, and what I believe is red maybe, this 380 foot West Virginia suspended span, it was suspended above water and it was being held by an I bar suspension, which I'll talk more about in a minute. This 700, oh, it, on the Ohio side, there's also a 380 foot suspended span. In the center between the two main piers is this 700 foot suspended span. It's these three spans right here that were suspended by I bars, an I bar chain and it snapped, as we'll learn later, and that entire part of the bridge fell. If you were lucky to be on these parts right here, or these two parts right here, you didn't collapse. Okay, the original plans called for three nine-foot lanes on that bridge. 
a left and a right lane and a lane in the center where you can pass somebody if you want to. Nine foot wide. That's 27 feet. But somebody changed it. They said, we need some a sidewalk. So what they did, they took five feet and used it for a sidewalk on the south side of the bridge. That left enough to make two 11-foot lanes on the north side of the bridge. Now, if you think about this, you've got cars and traffic traveling in two lanes on the north side of the bridge, but they're off center. The weight of the load on the bridge is shifted to the north side upstream because cars weren't driving on the sidewalk. That shifted the live load to the north. Now that put more strain on that side of the bridge, more strain on that I-bar chain. Uh, the original bridge was built with a wood floor. They laminated uh, timbers side to side, made out of redwood. Redwood holds up pretty good in the weather. But 13 years later, they realized that wood wasn't holding up so well. So they replaced the floor with a steel grid filled with concrete. Now the question is, did this increase the dead load on the bridge? Well, some say that concrete was only three inches thick, but I've heard other reports that it was six inches thick. Well, concrete is a lot heavier than wood, I feel. Here is a picture you may have seen before of the Silver Bridge right here. And we're gonna stand on the West Virginia side and right back there is the New York Central Railroad Bridge, which is still out there. Okay, here's another 1950s photo of the Silver Bridge. Uh, somehow, though, it's in collar. And you can see here, they don't have telephone lines like that anymore. But there's the bridge. Um, now, this is looking from the air. This is before the Silver Bridge fell. Here we are coming down the Ohio River from, say, Pomeroy and Mason and Point Pleasant right here. And right there you see the New York Central Railroad Bridge, but right here you see a bridge that looks almost white. That's because uh, the bridge was painted silver, so it doesn't show very well right there, but it's right there. And right here is a is what's called the Shadle Bridge. It's been replaced by a newer bridge now. When this bridge fell, they built a new one right down here. Uh, in 1937, we had a big flood here in Point Pleasant. I wasn't around then, but I've heard a lot about it. My dad talked about it a lot. But right there is the ramp. There's the Silver Bridge right there. There's a bunch of kids playing around out here on the ice, waiting to have an accident. In the background <laughs> is this bridge. Now, here's some common bridge truss designs. The Pratt is a well-known uh, uh, bridge truss, the Parker is, and the Warren. Now, it just so happens the Warren truss it was used on the Silver Bridge. And what you use bridge trusses for is to make the bridge rigid. Quite often, the trusses actually holds the floor and supports the floor of the bridge. In this case, the trusses didn't, weren't what supported the floor of the bridge. The suspension I-bar chain is what well, a pair of chains supported the bridge. But what these things did, it made the floor of the bridge rigid. Because if you don't have the floor of the bridge made stiff, in the wind, it'll start going like this. And you'll even start twisting and doing all kinds of things, and then it'll break. I want to talk about several types of bridges uh, so you can understand what a suspension bridge is if you don't already know. This is called a cantilever bridge. What you do is on this end you anchor one end of, of a large truss and you construct the truss across another pier and out to right here and it balances on this truss right here 
or it bounces on this pier right here and it's anchored right here on another pier or maybe the bridge ramp above it. And you start over here and you construct a large truss out to here. Same way. Now these two trusses will stay there and this right here hangs out over the water. Then you join the two with another truss. Okay, the truss actually supports the bridge floor. This is a strong bridge. As a matter of fact, this is the Silver Memorial Bridge down here that we have right now, and it's a cantilever bridge. As I mentioned, that was a cantilever that I just showed you. But you have an arch bridge where the floor here is supported by an archway. Here's an arch bridge down in Fayetteville, West Virginia, crossing New River Canyon. You can see the arch right here. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a good example of an arch bridge. And remember, I told you the deck floor. You need something to stiffen it. Look up here. There's truss work right there to stiffen that roadway. This is a cable stayed bridge. Now, the way it works is, out in the waterway, you have two piers anchored down in the rock bedrock. You have a road going across here. From the top of each pier, you have all of these cables that go down and attach themselves, and they fan out like that, and they hold the floor up. Has anybody seen a cable stay bridge anywhere? Look at that. Okay. And we have one close by. It joins Mason, West Virginia, right up here, with Pumbrel, Ohio. See, the floor is being supported by this fanned out assembly of cables here. Okay. Now, the suspension bridge. In a suspension bridge, you have to have several of these piers out in the water and towers that reach up here. Then you anchor a cable or a chain here and it loops up over the towers and down and up over the tower and down and it, and it has to be anchored here really firm or to pull loose. Then you have these suspenders coming down from it and the floor is attached to them. This is a vine bridge, prime example of a suspension bridge. And they used to, Indian or natives used to chase Tarzan across these and he'd get on the other side and try to cut this thing right here, let it fall. Here's another suspension bridge. It's a cable suspension. There's your cable. And they got the suspenders down here and the deck floors hanging from it. That was in 1933 to 1937. This bridge construction was going on. It was the Golden Gate Bridge. <coughs> also, we'll get to that one. <coughs> This is the Manhattan Suspension Bridge, uh, built in 1909. And you can see it there, the cables. So those are prime examples of those kind of bridges. Okay, now, here's the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington State. It was a cable suspension bridge. They built it around 1940, before the uh, World War II opened up. That bridge lasted four months. And you can see the cables up here. And it's very hard to see the suspended, the suspension cables, but you can make out a little bit of it. Okay. Notice the bridge floor is missing something. Stiffening trusses. That bridge worked up and down like a water wave and then started twisting. There was a car sitting right out here on this, and this guy jumped out of this car right there and ran all the way back here. He was having trouble standing up. It was like he was on a boat and it was rocking. He made it off there. Here's your silver bridge close up. Now, there's your two piers out in the water, and there's your 231 foot towers going up right there and right there. This is the suspension chain right here and right here. This up and down bridge work you see right here, that's a worn truss and it <coughs> stiffens the bridge floor and makes it solid. Now, 
these, this chain is made out of joints, of steel joints called eye barbs, right here. They, they attach at the top of the pier and come down, and right here they hook right into the top of the Warren Truss and become part of this Warren Truss. But when, where the chain rises towards the top of the tower and can't contact the truss, they have suspenders reaching down. You can't see them here, but you can see they're barbed. Right, there's one, there's one, there's one. There's suspender bars coming down and attached to the Warren truss. Okay, and um, these eye bars that make up the chain here will be longer than these down here. Okay, talk more about that in a minute. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about uh, steel, the stuff that the bridge was built out of. This is a crystal right here, crystal lattice. Each one of these things is an atom. Each thing there is an atom of iron, and in here we have an atom of carbon. And when you take iron, iron is not as tough as steel. You add some carbon to your iron, and it makes it a lot stronger because you've got this atom in here bonding to these iron atoms. You've got this carbon atom. So your carbon atom is sitting in here and your iron atom is out here. Well, right here is a large crystal. If you'll notice, everything is arranged in rows. Up and down and rows this way and rows back that way, back this way. Okay, that's a body-centered crystal is what you have right here. Well, on the Silver Bridge, there was something they didn't know about when they built the bridge. And, here was, and here's what it amounts to. If you have an environment where there's a source of, say, hydrogen or a corrosive environment, and in the Ohio River Valley and the Kanawha River Valley, as you know, we have a lot of power plants, burning coal. We have a lot of chemical plants. And they give off... Uh, something we call H2S, or hydrogen sulfide gas. And they also give off sulfur dioxide. We call it SO2. Well, the H2S will attach to um, oxygen and form sulfuric acid. Um, the SO, uh, the uh, the uh, sulfur dioxide, SO2, it will attach to water molecules and bond and form sulfurous acid. So see, you have acids being formed in the atmosphere of these gases uniting with moisture, like, you know, that's in the atmosphere. Sometimes it's like in vapor form or whatever, fog, clouds, things like that. Okay, those corrosive acids are present and they get on this steel. But one thing that I, I had studied in this was something called hydrogen embrittlement, sometimes called, uh, and also another thing, uh, sulfide, uh, hydrogen sulfide stress cracking. And here's what happens. These neat rows of crystals here, somehow hydrogen goes down in those because, as you know, hydrogen is, is, hydrogen is a small, it's, it's the smallest atom. It slips down in between these iron and carbon atoms. And that hydrogen may come from hydrogen sulfide. Well, those hydrogen atoms go down in here, but they do something when they're down there. Those hydrogen atoms attach themselves to a carbon atom. As a matter of fact, four hydrogen atoms attached to a carbon atom and form something called CH4 with this methane gas. When that methane gas forms inside there, it's a, that's another molecule and another thing to affect that crystal. It interferes with the bonds between these atoms and it spreads it apart. And if it spreads it apart a little bit, as you know, uh, if your windshield gets a little crack on the edge, sometimes it just goes twang, clear across. And if you split firewood, you hit the axe, you split it just about an inch, the whole thing splits apart. Well, that's exactly what happens right here. Hydrogen gets down in here, infiltrates down in here, and it doesn't have to go very far. Only an eighth of an inch. 
or three sixteenths of an inch, just the width of a matchstick or something. Okay, it goes down in here, spreads that apart, and then suddenly this crystal splits from top to bottom. And, and that's called, uh, as I mentioned there, hydrogen embrittlement. So, uh, and we sometimes refer to it as hydrogen sulfide stress cracking. Well, that is what caused the problem with this bridge. Because here we are looking at this bridge, and we're right here on the Ohio side. And right here is a, one of the main towers out in the water. Right there at that joint is where one of the eye bars, and I'll be talking about eye bars again in a moment, one of those eye bars had a little crack about an eighth of an inch deep in this hydrogen sulfide cracking. Suddenly, went critical and it cracked clear across. The eye bar broke. <coughs> when it broke, the whole bridge was doomed. And that's called, that joint has a number, C13N, N for north. 13 is, it's on eye bar 13. Now, I was talking about those eye bars. They look like this. They're about uh, 45 to 55 feet long, each one of them is. Right there's one, and here's another. Okay, and up here is two also. You bring these together, oh, and they have this eye right here in them, and there's a hole. I'll, I'll tell you that from right, clear across is 27 and a half inches that far. That hole right there is 11 and a half inches in diameter. I like that. Okay, we bring these two eye bars together and let them meet these two eye bars, and this thing right here is a suspension apparatus that fits in between them, and this thing hanging down is a hanger that goes down and holds on to the, it hooks onto the uh, bridge floor. We bring these together and we put this big pin, it's 13 inches long, 11 and a half inches in diameter, it's inserted in that hole. Then, to keep it from slipping out of that hole, we put two end caps on it, which are kind of like giant washers. And there's a hole through the center of that pin, and you run a long bolt through there and put two lock nuts on each end. Now, this is the assembly before it goes together. Here is, whoops, once again. Here it is after it's joined together. See it all right here? Two eye bars meeting two eye bars, holes lined up. Here's your suspension assembly going down this way. And there's the big pin, and see the caps right there? That cap goes on there, that bolt goes clear through. That bolt's not holding the load. It's just keeping the caps in place so the pin can't work its way out. Okay, I call that the eye bar suspender pin cap bolt assembly, is what I call it. <laughs> um, I mentioned a moment ago, sometimes the eye bars incorporate right into the top of the Warren truss, the Warren stiffening truss. Well, right here's how that happens. The eye bars come here like this, and you don't have the suspender coming down. This is the Warren Truss, uh, members of the Warren Truss, and it's a very complicated looking joint. But that's how it goes together. That's my eye bar and attachment to a depth, uh, deck stiffening truss. Now here's the end or eye of an eye bar right there. This is after the bridge fell, someone took a picture. Um, this is one where they took a torch and cut a piece of it all, and here's the pin. And here's the end caps, and there's the bolt going through it. This is on display down at the River Museum down the street here, down about First Street, somewhere down that area. Now, the cause of eye bar failure, I told you a moment ago about that. Those hydrogen atoms getting down in there and spreading that crystal lattice apart and just splitting it. And it went critical. Well, there's two kinds of things that cause failure. There's stress corrosion cracking, and it's the formation of brittle cracks in a normally sound material through the simultaneous action of a tensile stress and a corrosive environment. You have all this pulling on those eye bars, pulling on them, tension on them, and then you have a corrosive environment and snap like that. Okay, and here's the other one. Corrosion fatigue it occurs as a result of the combined action of a cyclic stress and a corrosive environment. Okay, these two things are different, but they are very similar because they both have a corrosive environment involved. But this one up here is a, like a stress, a constant stress on it. This down here is stress that occurs in cycles, like a big load goes across, crack in steel right there. 
One eighth of an inch doesn't sound like anything, especially when that eye it is one limb of that eye is eight inches, two inches thick and eight inches wide. And the same on the other side, but just that one eighth of an inch is all it takes. Within seconds, it can go critical. The whole thing just fractures right across. Now, here is actually a photograph of the end of that eye bar. They, divers, found that, well, they found the eye bar real easy, but divers actually found the end of the eye bar that broke off right there. When I first saw this one time, a long time ago, I thought, at the lab, they took a saw and sawed off a piece of this and sawed off a piece of that, and I thought they were testing them. Then I learned something else. That right there is a straight break, clear across, right there. This break right here originally joined to this right here. And that's called a cleavage, a cleavage fracture. A cleavage fracture is when a crystal splits. You get a cleavage, cleavage fracture. Look how straight that is. Just a straight line right across like you saw it. Now, what happened then, you have like, you know, a million or so pounds of tense and tension on that. This hole stretched until it was oval shaped. And this opened up right here. Now, once it bent so far on that side over there, you didn't get a, a cleavage fracture. You got a ductal fracture, a jagged fracture. This end of the eye bar broke, broke clear off. Once that end of the eye bar broke clear off, the two eye bars separated. Now, that left two eye bars to hold the load. But that wouldn't work because now the pin was out of balance. Nothing to hold it in place. The pin twisted sideways under the tension instantly. Twisted sideways and then under the pressure, those, that bolt goes through there, popped. And the end caps popped off and the other two eye bars slipped clear off the pin. The whole chain broke in two. Now, when that whole chain broke in two, you lost equilibrium on the north side of the bridge. The chain from Ohio to West Virginia went limp. The other chain on the upper, on the, on the southbound side, was still holding. So the eye bars, the south side of the towers was held still, the north side were free and this thing they separated and twisted. And the eye bars was twisted like this. And you lost support in the north side suspension chain. That dropped the whole Warren truss assembly, deck assembly and all down with these cars on it. At the same time, the towers twisted sideways and flopped over. Within a short period of time, within seconds, that bridge was going down. And some say, some claim it took a minute for it to fall. But I think it happened pretty, pretty fast. It was on de December 15, 1967, at 5 p.m. is when it happened. A micro crack went critical up at joint C13N, chain broke, bridge twisted, went in all kinds of different directions and collapsed. And all the cars on it went down with it. Um, at 5 p.m., I just was being picked up by a car to take me to a church play practice. Okay, I got in the car, we drove to the church play practice. They passed, this was the first evening to practice for a Christmas play at Oak Grove United Methodist Church out in the early tarp. Anyhow, we got in there, we got our play booklets and stuff, and we started getting ready you know, to get our parts and stuff. Another car pulled up play practice and they came in and they said we just heard on our car radio and it was probably about I would say about 15 20 minutes after 5 and play practice is going to start about 5 30. They said we just heard on the car radio that the silver bridge at Point Pleasant fell into the river immediately people said what do we do what do we do they said could should we cancel play practice they said definitely we'll cancel play practice and took our booklets back up they said, we'll get back to this later, but we gotta get home and find out if we have any family members on that bridge. Everybody headed for home. Well, I happen to know that my dad was supposed to go after a load of flooring at French City Lumber 
after work, and at five o'clock would be a good time for him to be going. And so, you know, I thought, huh, it could be him. He could be on that. Anyhow, at about all, it was probably about 5.30, I was dropped back off my house. My dad just pulled in, and he wanted to know why I was, I was back from play practice early. And by the way, that play practice was canceled, and the whole uh, Christmas uh, celebration at the church was canceled. But he wanted to know what happened. I told him, I said, one of the church members said the Silver Bridge failed. He said, he's wrong. He said, who's telling you that kind of stuff? I told him who it was. He said, can't be right. He said, because he said, I was thinking about, he said, I was thinking about crossing that to go after that load of flooring, but he said, I only had about an eighth of a tank of gas. So he said, there was an awful crowd, a bunch of cars going on and all that. And he said, I thought I'd better run up to Bob Lewis's Texaco, get some gasoline. He said, I drove straight up to Bob Lewis's Texaco, and that's just less than an eighth of a mile off the road here. He drove up there, when he pulled in, Bob Lewis came out and said, sorry, but I won't be able to gas you up. He says, the electricity just went off. But he said, if it comes back on, I can gas you up. Well, my dad stood and talked to him for a few minutes, and uh, he said, well, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm just going to drive on home, but I'll come back in maybe later and get gas. So he had driven on home. He might have missed being on the bridge. Who knows? There's a million people out there that says that they just missed being on it. But anyhow, my dad said, he said, that's, he said, that's a bunch of nonsense. He said, that bridge is, was right there when I went past it. He said, I saw cars driving on off of it. He said, but wait a minute. He said, that electric failure. He said, there's something wrong there. He said, let's get to town. So we drove to town and I got in here and drove uh, past the courthouse, looked over, saw bridge missing. We drove right straight down and parked behind G.C. Murphy Company, which is now the same place that uh, Mason Jar Antiques is. We parked there, walked through an alleyway onto uh, Fifth Street, walked through the gate at the in the flood wall, right uh, let's see, right down there, the next gate down, the one. The next one up from the Mothman Festival and the, and the uh, statue. We walked through that gate, looked our left, sure enough, entire bridge missing. Not a bit of it was showing. But meanwhile, it had turned dark. Now it was still daylight at 5 o'clock, but it began darkening at 5.10 and continually got dark. But it still wasn't totally dark. There was a few people standing along the riverbank, not hardly. Very, not hardly anybody was there though. And, um, but one of the things that stood out was all the yelling and stuff that was going on and the boats in the water. There was boats with floodlights on them going back and forth. And I know that uh, City Ice and Fuel down here, some of the men working down there had heard noise and had looked and saw the bridge had gone down or something and they jumped in a boat down there and came up there and searched and they were able to rescue a few people and uh, a barge that was down near the mouth of the Canola River picked up a guy who was floating in the water and rescued him. Uh, right here is where I stood on the Ohio side that night. We walked right up here and there's the box burger assembly still in place but look at this eye bar. That eye bar chain is going down into the river. It's supposed to be going up this way down in the river. Uh, I believe this was taken the next day. There was somebody there. Um, here's another picture, though. Right here was my standing location on that night next to the massive eye bars. And, um, of course, it was dark. But I went over and touched one of these eye bars, but I probably shouldn't have because I'll tell you why. There was so much tension on that. If that bolt right there had popped off, that eye bar would have come loose and come around and swatted me uh, permanently. Uh, there's what I saw out in the river. That very picture right there. All these boats surging. Rescue underway. And um, I didn't get a chance to really look at this, but I guess somebody stretched a rope across the Point Pleasant ramp so that some of these people that was coming there wouldn't walk up there and just drop off the edge into the river. Here's the collapse scene on the Ohio side. There's a mess right here. And as soon as they could, they brought the best equipment they could get, which was some wreckers. 
right? There's a wrecker. And there's another wrecker sitting here somewhere, right there. They brought wreckers in to try to winch steel off cars because there were some people still in vehicles trapped underneath. And here's some more equipment arriving, but later on, here's what came. A big crane right here on a barge came down here, and that was from the MT Epling Company. The next day, Point Pleasant Register looked like this, Silver Bridge Tunnels. The Charleston Daily Mail looked like this, Bridge Disaster Toll May Reach 46. And the Cleveland Plain Dealer had this picture right here of two men, two truckers that had actually survived the fall. They're in the hospital right here. Now here's an aerial view of the Ohio side. If you'll notice right back there is the bridge ramp and abutment. And then here's the box girder assembly. Anybody on that was safe. From here out to here, the bridge fell, but the people landed on land. Some of those people actually crawled out of their cars and walked up here to the road right here. <coughs> Some of them was fatally injured. Right here, there was this part of that side that fell in the water right here, and there was some deaths here. And you've heard people mention right there, You've heard people mention Tiny's supermarket that was over there. People crossed this bridge a lot of times on, on Saturday. We did on Saturday. We were going to get groceries at Tiny's uh, uh, supermarket right there, run by Otis Burris. There was a lot of people went over there to buy their own groceries. Uh, here's some more bridge wreckage on the Ohio side. And the reason why we have these pictures is because on the Ohio side, on the West Virginia side, it was all down in the water. On the high side, you can take pictures of it. Look at the eye bar right there. You can see the eye bar right there integrated into the Warren Trust right here. There's a car pinned right here. There's some people standing up there on that bridge girder assembly. There's a wrecker right here. Uh, more, whoops, more pictures right there. More pictures. There's a crane. Here's a McLean tractor trailer. Here's something like, I don't know what that is, a 55 Chevy or a, some other car right there. I don't know what that is for sure. More records, more wreckage, cars, tractor trailer. Um, more wreckage, here's a car pinned underneath here. More wreckage, I, out here is a crane on the MT Epling out there working. <laughs> This was taken during the daytime. Right here is that grid, con is that steel grid with concrete in it. Right there is some bridge flooring. <coughs> here's some more of it right here. Uh, here's, a, here's a road tractor, I call it. Tractor trailer, there it is upside down right there. There's your box girder assembly. You can see it right there. It's pretty massive. <clears throat> More wreckage. This is on the Ohio side also. This little piece was above the water right here. There's a tractor trailer in that. And more of the same. Here, that night, there was a state road meeting taking place in Charleston. And during the state road meeting, some guy came in and whispered in the ear and said, hey, you've got a road problem, the Silver Bridge collapsed. So they got Hewlett Smith right here, the governor, and all of them drove down here right away. And they didn't just stand on the bank, you know, and, and gawk at it. They all had plans, rescue people, get the bridge replaced, find out what happened, all that. They, they formulated the plan real quick and went to work. And also they called the best people to come in. Uh, they brought Dravo, Dravo, I was working on locks and dams down here. They had them bring their big crane up here. Big crane mounted on a barge and worked with MT Epling Company. And, and they made arrangements for the money and everything to do this operation. But here's Hewlett Smith out on the water right there watching. Uh, here's some spectators on the Ohio side standing by the, uh, by the railroad bridge pier. But the spectators on the West Virginia side were up here sitting on the flood wall at this time. More 
this is West Virginia side right here. Funny you can't see any buildings, but they are there. Pier on the West Virginia side right there, and see the section of the roadway leaning down into the water. Now, yeah. uh, okay, this machine right here was acquired by the Civil Defense in Point Pleasant. Uh, it's called a, they call it a, a duck. It's an amphibious vehicle. You can drive it on land, drive it in the water. Uh, the Civil Defense put those to use right quick. Here is that duck in the background right here, and here's some people working. And right here, I think we have some high school kids working here. I'm not sure them. I think I recognize this kid right here. And um, now they're at the 4th Street flood wall gate. That's down where the uh, amphitheater is, Riverfront Park, the mall fan statue right there. What used to be right there was a brick ramp that went down into the river. Uh, here's somebody coming up the ramp, for, uh, some firemen. They're bringing a dead body. Okay, here's the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers out of Huntington. They're working here on the barge. Okay, those were divers. There's a diver out there working. It's cold weather. Diver hooking a crane. Uh, here's some rescue work going on on the West Virginia side. This guy right here, don't look at his dress too well. It looks like he might have come out right out of his office and come down there to help or something the next day. Uh, there's the MT Eplin's big crane. And this is Drovo's big crane right here that they sent out. And these are cranes at work. Um, that looks like, uh, this is Gravo here. Let's see. Here's a crane pulling a car out of the water. Right here, uh, right here is where they started putting the pieces of the bridge together to try to assemble them and see what went wrong. And maybe this is in a field. There's a big field over at Henderson. Here's a bunch of eye bars stretched out there, and there's a pin. Oh, here's that eye bar and pin down at Point Pleasant River Museum once again. Notice it's pitted and rusted right to here. Uh, by the way, they found uh, damage in several other eye bars of the same nature. So if it didn't break there, it was going to break in another place. Uh, there's that, well, oh. there's that piece right there that they found down in the river. And there's your cleavage fracture and your ductal fracture right there. It's laying on a pallet. Uh, here's the National Traffic uh, Safety Board did a diagram of the load on the bridge. Look over here, the West Virginia side, not much there. Most of it is in the lane going towards Ohio and some right in the center right there. But what's that one right there? That one did not fall because uh, Charlene Wood, Charlene Clark Wood, was in that car, she pulled onto the bridge, saw it was falling, jammed her car in reverse and backed up to keep from going down, to get on solid ramp, but her engine stalled, but her car actually had some momentum and it came back fast enough that she landed on the box girder with her front wheels hanging over. Oh, wow. And Rudy O'Dell, a uh, state trooper, went up there and helped her out of the car, and a guy named uh, Robert Remmel or something like that went up there. Okay. And if you'll see, anybody, these people right here were all in that center span. They went down. These people right here went down in the water right below that span. These people right here, right in there, was on this part of the suspended span that was above land right there. They either got hurt injured or walked out. Uh, a few got killed or walked away. Anybody on that ramp right there, there's a bunch of them on that ramp, these people here, they just look back and was glad that they didn't get down with it. Here's another di uh, diagram by the U.S. Department of Transportation, National Transportation Safety Board. This document has a lot of good information in it. And here's a model of the bridge. Uh, I think it's down here at the River Museum. It was last time I was down there. Right up here, the arrow I think is pointing to the wrong place. Right up there is where the chain broke. Uh, this bridge right here, 
is a duplicate, practically, of the Silver Bridge, but it was at St. Mary's. Immediately, uh, somebody with the highway department said, Governor, St. Mary's has got an identical bridge. And he said, shut it down. He shut it down. But the people up there, after a few days, began to raise cane because they couldn't cross the river. There was so much political pressure, they reopened that bridge. But a few months later, the federal government came in and said, wait a minute, why is that bridge still open? The federal government shut that bridge down. That was the end of that. That was the Hiram Carpenter Bridge. Oh, by the way, they had just named it after Hiram Carpenter a few days before it was permanently shut down. Uh, Hiram Carpenter uh, was one of the people who was instrumental in building it. Now, here's the, the road deck of the St. Mary's Bridge. And if you want to look at that so you can see what it was like crossing the Silver Bridge. See the suspension chains coming down there and going up there? It broke on the other side of that right there. But this wasn't the bridge. This was St. Mary's Bridge. Notice it's missing something. It's got the two 13-foot uh, lanes and no sidewalk over there. Before the bridge collapsed, there's your railroad bridge, there's the silver bridge. After it collapsed, railroad bridge, no silver bridge, but there's these piers still there and tore them down later. Uh, here's a big pier right here that stood out there in the river for a long time. Back there's New York Central Railroad Bridge. There's a memorial on the West Virginia side. It's right outside the doors right here to the left right up there. Right on the other side of this building is another building. And right on the side of that building is where you used to get on the bridge. Uh, there's another memorial over in the courthouse lawn and it says Silver Bridge Collapse and it tells about it and says a uh, failed eye bar, and a failed eye bar, joint and weld identified as cause. I don't recall a weld, but anyhow. But over on the high side, they got their own memorial right here. And this is the back side of the memorial. It has the names of everybody that was on the bridge. Now, this is interesting. That right there is not an eye bar. If you've been looking at my diagrams, that's the big pin and bolt and cap assembly right there. And that right there is that hanger assembly that the suspenders hook onto and hang down to support the bridge. Only it's upside down. On the actual bridge, that right there would be down here. And there'd be a hanger going down to the deck floor. That's not an eye bar. It's the eye bar pin and hanger assembly. But look at here. It says on the plaque over here, that's a silver bridge eye bar. Now, here's some vehicle statistics. And here's the sum up of the whole thing. There were 13 vehicles on the bridge when it collapsed. 31 of these fell with the fell with the bridge into the water. Well, correction, 31 of them fell either on dry land or in water. There's a difference here to here of seven vehicles. That's because seven vehicles were setting on a concrete bridge abutment or they were setting, well, they were actually were setting on the box girder part. That's the difference between the 37 vehicles that were on the bridge and 31 that fell. Six were setting on box girder assemblies, including Charlene Wood. 31, uh, 24 of these fell in the water. Well, the difference between this and this right here is, what, seven. That's because seven of them landed on dry land over on the high side. Casualties, 46 died. Nine were injured, 19 were uninjured, most were on the box girder span, and some actually fell on land. And, uh, or they might have even been on the concrete bridge abutment right there. Um, years after this happened, uh, 48 years later or something, somebody I uh, told this story to somebody and they said, why don't you write a book? <laughs> so I wrote this book right here and that book I uh, sold on Amazon. And it's also sold down at the Mothman Festival today, my vendor table, under the white tent behind the 
Mothman Museum in that area, behind the statue down there, the Mothman statue. Um, here is an early photo of the Silver Bridge from the West Virginia side also. I just I'd like to put those in here. What's that? Yeah, somebody put that in there. Now, here's something I've got to say about the Mothman. That was a year before, and I was here and knew those people that saw the Mothman. I knew those people that saw the Mothman, including the four that saw it the first night, and later I met the one that saw it the next night. And then I knew the, the Thomas family and all of them, and they had an, uh, an encounter at their house. And uh, I will say this, I do, uh, I support the Mothman theory. Uh, I, I believe the moth, they saw something up there, and I'm behind the Mothman thing. However, I do not connect the Mothman to the bridge. This was a structural failure in that eye bar right over there. Somebody put that in there. Uh, they did say the Mothman was flying around the bridge. Um, and so, um, and that was, there was some, uh, some winos under the red box curve. They said they living under there. They thought they saw it. But uh, this somebody put in the picture. Uh, right here, when the bridge fell, what did we do? Well, for a while, for a few days, we had to drive all the way up to Pomeroy, cross that bridge, and come down the other side, Route 7. But pretty soon, they went over here to Henderson and put a ferry boat, a, a dock right there. So we'd go over to Henderson, get on a ferry boat, go across the river, and get off on the high side. Matter of fact, I went over with my dad. We finally got on that thing right there, rode to the other side, and went to French City Lumber and bought that flooring we were supposed to be doing when we were flooring a house. Several, a number of days later, we went there and got that flooring and came back across on that. Uh, here's a postcard that I saw, and I just thought I'd throw that picture on there. That's a nice picture of it. And uh, here's an analysis right here of the bridge failure. It says something right here. The cause of the fracture was traced to a 1 8 inch deep elliptical shaped crack on the inside of the pinhole. Now look at this, the design live load stress in the shank of the eye bar was 12.5 thousand pounds per square inch and the dead load design was 36 thousand pounds per square inch. Putting the live load, live load and dead load together, we've got, um, we got 48.5 thousand pounds per square inch. They said that they believed that it experienced 41 thousand pounds per square inch, which is getting up pretty close to 48. That bridge was overloaded. But that wasn't what made it go. It's that tiny crack. And they believe that there was a defect in that eye bar when it was forged. Okay, that's the end. Now, there's somebody coming up, I think. Um, okay. Are there any questions on anything? I don't know if I can answer them or not, but yes. Uh, no. There was a girl from uh, Ordnance Elementary School uh, in the fifth grade, I think. Her body was never found. And there was another woman, um, her last name was Turner. Uh, the, the girl at the Ordnance Elementary School's name was, I think, Kathy Bias. Never was found. Uh, there was a, a Turner lady riding in one of the cars. She was never found. Now, I was concerned at one time because I was keeping posted by the news because they said there was a baby missing. And someone said, baby missing, he's done gone downstream. They found the mother and the baby about a mile and a half down the high river lodged in some roots. And the mother was still hanging on to the baby. Like I said, uh, when I was out here uh, 50 years ago, I never dreamed I'd be in here doing this. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, I don't know if they did or not, but they built a new one and tore that one down. They probably looked at it, but. 
I don't know. They got enough information for this one, I think. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, all any kind of bridges like this that didn't have a lot of redundancy. Now, this bridge could have had redundancy if they had laminated like six eye bars together, and then over here had six eye bars laminated together. So one broke, all the others would hold. Uh, but bridges must have uh, all kinds of redundancy, and they've also done away a lot with the suspension bridge stuff. If this bridge had had a cable suspension, you wouldn't have got that duct, uh, that cleavage fracture all the way across because if it snapped one strand, you still have all your other strands. That's redundancy then. Now redundancy means when something breaks, there's something else to take hold, to back it up. Anything else? Yes? I'm sure there were lawsuits up uh, the zoo afterwards. Who was, was anybody found to be liable for failure? Well, there was a lawsuit, uh, you'll find it in my book. It's in my book, uh, the Cantrell versus some state of West Virginia and all that stuff. And a bunch of lawyers determined that uh, uh, the state of West Virginia wasn't at fault and nobody was to blame. They said nobody could have known that you would get a stress crack like that. And so uh, those lawsuits didn't go anywhere. I guess that's it.